inward change within their lives. So praise the Lord for that. All right. Well, it was Joe and Sally. They had a perpetual problem. They didn't even realize what that problem was there for a period of time. And uh, but you see, they were, uh, they were, uh, Joe had just turned 30, and Sally was 28, and they just had their third child, and uh, so their oldest child was four years old at this time. So they had been married for quite a while. They did not have much acquaintance with church. Both of them, when they were young, very young, had been invited to church a few times. But, you know, their families didn't know much about church either. And, uh, but when you have these life changes come about, these transitions in life, like getting married is one, and then whenever you have children, that's another change that comes about. And, then, uh, then later on you have what's called the empty nest. We've had that three or four times. I kept coming back, and that's great. They were invited. <laughs> and, uh, so thank the Lord for that. In fact, I'm glad one time we were able to do it because uh, uh, one of them had a fire in their home. They needed a few weeks to uh, stay somewhere. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> But Joe and Sally, they had these things going on in their lives, and they had a friend who had invited them to church right after their first child was born. So they thought, well, it would be good for us to go to church. We probably ought to do that. And so they came a time or two, and then the next year they came on Christmas, and they came on Easter. And... A lot of people, that's the only times that they go to church, and somebody asked him that about that one time. He said, well, uh, they don't, I won't come to your church because you only got two sermons. I said, well, when do you come? He said, Christmas and Easter. <laughs> so, sermon about the birth of Christ and one about the resurrection. Okay, you get it. Uh, and there was a family, you know, that came to church one time, and uh, the little boy kept watching his dad during the service. And uh, so they had the singing and all of that. And then the people walked around and they had the offering plates and they passed them down and came by his dad and he watched his dad put something on the offering plate. And then after that, he thought it was real interesting. What church was like, he was excited about it. Incidentally, we don't have the offering plates here, but we did have a box back there in the back. And, uh, but anyway, on their way home, the dad, he started getting a little bit critical of the church service. So he didn't really like some of the songs that they picked out, and he didn't like how they sang some of the songs. And then uh, he talked about the temperature that was in the church. Let's not get into that, because nobody agrees on that, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> but he didn't like that. And uh, then the preacher got up and something the preacher said, he commented on that, kind of a, uh, a put-down comment. And the little boy was just waiting to make his comment. He said, but Dad, I thought it was a really good show for only a quarter. <laughs> he saw what his dad put in. Well, thinking about offerings here. Now, when we get to the scripture, it's going to talk about offerings. And it's going to talk about sacrifice and offerings. But getting back to Joe and Sally, they came to church. They came a couple times during the year. And then after that, they kind of increased a little bit. And after the second child was born, I guess you could say probably on average, maybe about once a month, um, they made it to church. And then this third child was born. They said, we're going to start going to church every week. But their perpetual problem was that they felt guilty. And the reason why they felt guilty is because there is a real guilt for human beings. We are all guilty of sin. And uh, there comes a point in our lives that we become sinners by choice. We, we just disobey God. We disobey the scriptures and we disobey the laws of God. And that is deep down within us. And sometimes 
it surfaces. And coming to church, lots of times that will surface because we read the scriptures. And the scriptures are like a mirror. And you hold it up. And you look in the mirror and you have to say, there's a guilty person before God. Well, they didn't. They couldn't articulate that, but there was just that little bit there. But they were drawn to come to church, and they wanted to do better, and they wanted to have a better life, and but they had this sense of guilt. That was their perpetual problem. So then they finally decided, okay, like a lot of people do, we'll work it out like this, like, like the teeter-totter, you know? <laughs> got the fulcrum in the middle and you put it away on one side and then you put it on the other side and it comes up and balances it up. So they began to understand that their problem was their guilt so they were going to start doing good deeds to balance it out. Some people think, a lot of people think, it's pretty common to think it's like that. You balance it out. If you have more good deeds when you die, then you'll make it to heaven. I've got bad news for you. <laughs> The Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Oh, it may move that balance beam just a little bit, but it's not enough. It's not enough for all the sin that have come short of the glory of God. And so they went through that process and they were trying to balance that out in their lives. Well, so they had the guilt that was there. Now, as we come to the scripture here, in Numbers chapter 28, God is dealing with the nation of Israel. You had the, well, we did Sunday school lesson uh, this morning on Joseph. And uh, Joseph is going to come to Egypt, and he's going to become second in command. There's going to be a great famine. His family is going to come down and join them. And then they're going to multiply, and over a period of 400 years, they become a great nation, but they're slaves. And Moses comes, and God leads Moses to go to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him, let my people go. And Pharaoh refuses to do that. And then God starts bringing plagues upon the people. And finally, it gets down to the tenth plague. And at every point, sometimes Pharaoh would act like he's going to let him go, but he always came back and said no, he would not. Finally, it came down to the tenth plague, and that was going to be the death of the firstborn. How many people in here are the firstborn child in your family? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can see that that would be cause for concern. Because all, all the other plagues had happened. And so this one was going to be the death of the firstborn that was coming in there. Well, anyway, you had that, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. And so they, they got delivered, and they made it through the Red Sea. If you've watched the Ten Commandments, you know about that. If you've been in Sunday school, you know about that. They walked across the Red Sea on dry ground. And they had the opportunity to go into the promised land. And they sent ten spies in to just see what it was like. And the ten spies came back, and, or twelve spies, and ten of them gave a bad report. Ten were bad, and two were good. I got it. <laughs> ten were bad, and two were good. Joshua and Caleb gave a good report. They said, let's go in. So there's giants there, but God is with us. We can take the land. The other ten said, no, no, we can't do it. We can't make it. They were fearful. And the crowd was swayed by the ten. And God told them, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And they did. So the book of Numbers is the story of the wilderness wanderings. So you had it started out the first couple of chapters with just like a couple of years period of time. And then you've had 38 years passed since then. And now we're down in the last five months. And Moses knows that it's finally ending and they're going to get to go into the promised land. 
But he finds out that he's not going to be able to go himself. And he starts putting things in order. And he prays to God for a successor in his position of being the leader of the people. And God told him it would be Joshua. So he's got that taken care of. Check mark. Taken care of. He's getting close. And then God says, this is a brand new generation. The older generation has all passed away. And so he repeats the law. He's giving him all the instruction that he can, again, about the things of God. And then we come here in the Numbers, chapter 28. He's going to give them instructions about sacrifices and offerings. The offerings, they were offering sacrifices. And uh, so we have that here, the frequency of, of the offerings. Now, uh, sacrifices are there just about every culture in the world. They understand something about sacrifice. That sacrifices, if they have a false god, they, they, they will think that some kind of sacrifice will appease that god in some way. Now, we had the true god, but he still is having them offer sacrifices. And uh, we will see why that is in just a moment. But let's look at the frequency of the offerings here. In verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say to them, My offering and my bread for my sacrifices made by fire, for a sweet savor to me, you shall observe to offer to me in their due seasons. And you shall say to them, This is the offering made by fire that you shall offer to the Lord, two lambs of the first year without spot, day by day, for a continual burnt offering. You shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and you shall offer the other lamb at evening, and a tenth part of an ephah of flour for a grain offering mingled with a fourth part of a hen, a measurement of beaten oil, it is a continual burnt offering that was uh, ordained on Mount Sinai for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire to the Lord. And the drink offering shall be the fourth part of the hen and of the, uh, for the one lamb in the holy place. You shall cause the wine to be poured to the Lord for a drink offering, and you shall offer the other lamb at evening. You shall offer it as the grain offering at the morning and as a drink offering, a sacrifice made by, made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. What you had was a daily offering. The lamb in the morning and the lamb in the evening and then the stuff about the, the grain and the, the drink offering. You have that. Okay, and then the next <coughs> verse on the Sabbath day, two lambs of the first year without spot and two-tenths of a portion of flour for a grain offering mingled with oil and its drink offering. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath besides the continual burnt offering and its drink <coughs> offering. So you have a weekly sacrifice and offering going on in addition to the daily sacrifices and offering. On the Sabbath, it's double. You have two lambs in the morning, two in the evening. Okay? In verse 11 we read, And in the beginning of your months, you shall offer a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bulls and one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot, without spot and three-tenths of a portion of flour for a grain offering mingled with oil for, for one bull, and a separate tenth of a portion of flour mingled with oil for a grain offering for each lamb, for a burnt offering, a sweet savor, a sacrifice spice made by fire to the Lord, and their drink offering shall be half a hen of wine for a bull, and a third part of a hen per ram and a fourth part of a hen for a lamb. 
This is the burnt offering for every month throughout the months of the year. And one young goat shall be offered for a sin offering to the Lord. Besides the continual burnt offering and its drink offering. What you have is you have daily sacrifices going on. You have weekly sacrifices going on. And you have monthly sacrifices going on. And that shows that there is a perpetual need, <laughs> the sacrifice for sin. That guilt that Joe and Sally were experiencing is a perpetual problem. They kept trying to balance it out. They got to the point to where they were coming to church weekly. They daily were trying to do good deeds. They were trying to be like the Boy Scouts, you know. A Boy Scout's supposed to do a good deed every day. One day he saw a lady standing on the street corner. He went over and grabbed her arm and helped her get across the street. And she turned to him and said, but I didn't want to cross the street. And so they kept trying to do good deeds daily, but that wasn't working. So you had the guilt. Well, coming to church weekly, Easter's coming up. The pastor decides to preach on the Passover. And so he talks about those ten plagues. And he talks about the death of the firstborn. And then he talks about how that they were instructed to take a branch of hyssop and dunk it down in the blood of the lamb that was slain and put it on the doorpost, at the top of the doorpost and the side of the doorpost. And if they were to do that, whoever resided in that house, that firstborn would be safe when they did that. And so that happened. Just that way, the death angel came and he passed over. Sometimes we sing the song, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so he started preaching about that. And I started thinking about well, these sacrifices here. What is it about these sacrifices? And he talked about the fact that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And then it started coming to them where they understood. They, they See, they heard snippets of the gospel. I mean, it was presented, but they weren't getting it. But on this day, he's talking about the blood of the Passover lamb. And then he talked about the life of the flesh is in the blood. And they began to understand. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That's what all this killing was about. Was It was a death, a death that was taking place because of sin. It was a sacrifice for sin. And it happened daily because they had the need all the time for it to be sacrificed. And then we understood that all these things that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but they understood that this was a symbol. It was a symbol. It was a constant reminder daily. Wherever they were in the camp, they would look toward the middle where the tabernacle was, and they could see the smoke from the sacrifice. And it was a reminder that there was a sacrifice for sin. And you see, they were all saved on credit because they were looking at the symbol they believed God, they obeyed God, they brought the lambs for the sacrifices, and, and that was what brought their salvation. But it all pointed toward the time that Jesus was going to come. And he was going to be put on the cross. The blood sacrifice. And he is the eternal Son of God. And so that's why his death was a diff different from any other death. His death was that infinite death that could pay for the sins of mankind. Woo! <laughs> Joe and Sally sat there in their congregation that day and they thought, wow! Wow! We've been trying to do all these good deeds and we'll still try to do them, but we're not doing very well at it. But we have sinned. But the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. They begin to understand that. They understand that Jesus died on the cross. They said, oh, that song. We sing, they sing it lots of times. And 
Galatians, it says that Jesus paid it all. It clicked. It came into their minds. Okay. There was an awakening. So you had the pastor, as I said, had preached on the Passover. The next part here in uh, 28, it talks about what happens next. And on the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. Some people just call this whole thing the Passover. Some of them say that's the Passover, and the next one is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And on the 15th day of the month is the Feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. We're going to have a great church service. <laughs> you shall do uh, no manner of servile work on it, but you shall offer a sacrifice made by fire for a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bulls and one ram, and seven lambs of the first year. They shall be for you without blemish, and their grain offering shall be a flour mingled with oil. You shall offer three-tenths of a portion for a bull and two-tenths of a portion for a ram. You shall offer a separate tenth of a portion for each of the seven lambs and one goat for a sin offering to make an atonement for you. You shall offer these beside the burnt offering in the morning, which is for a continual burnt offering. In this way, you shall offer the meal of the sacrifice made by fire daily throughout the seven days of a sweet savor to the Lord. It shall be offered beside the continued burnt offering and its drink offering. And on the seventh day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Joe and Sally, they were kind of getting it. And then they heard about Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a man who wanted to please God. In fact, he became a monk, and he heard about a certain thing that he could do. He could go to this certain place. It was some marble steps. It was reported to be steps that Jesus walked up uh, whenever he appeared before Pilate. And later on in history, it was moved to Rome, from what I understand. But anyway, Martin Luther went to this. And the idea was that you were to climb it on your knees. And he started climbing it on his knees. And his knees started getting bloody as he was going up it. And you were to say the Lord's Prayer at each step of the way. And the idea was that if you did this and you made it to the top, you could pray someone out of purgatory. And his idea was that he wanted to pray his grandfather out of purgatory. Now, I need to stop here for a minute. I, I, you know, that's not me, and I don't believe that's the way it is. But even Martin Luther, when he got to the top, he said, what if it doesn't work? And later, he talked to his son, and he said, you know, about three-fourths of the way up those steps, it came to my mind the words from Habakkuk that said, the just shall live by faith. And so Joe and Sally are hearing this story too. And they're thinking they're, the just shall live by faith. You have salvation. It's the gift of God. How do you get it? You get it by faith. And by faith you become righteous. And so we have the righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ that clothes us. It was a day, it was an awakening. It was a day of victory for them. Now, we'll just go ahead and get this other paragraph here. It said also, on the day of the first fruits, we also call this one Pentecost. It said, while you bring a new grain offering to the Lord, after your weeks are out, seven weeks, going to be 49 days, 50th day, 5 times 10, Penta Pentecost. So it came there. You shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work, but you shall offer the burnt offering for a sweet savor to the Lord. Two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs for the first year. And after their grain offering, a fire mingled with oil, three-tenths of a portion for one bull, two-tenths of a portion for one ram, a separate tenth of a portion for each of the seven lambs, 
and one young goat to make an atonement for you, and they shall be for you without blemish. You shall offer them and their drink offerings besides the continual burnt offering and its grain offering. And so they, they celebrated Pentecost every year. They celebrated it from the time of Moses on down to the time that you had a 400 year, uh, year period of silence uh, as far as getting word from God, but they continued to celebrate Pentecost. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus came to this earth and he started his ministry. And he spent three years in his ministry and after that, he was crucified and he rose again victorious yeah. over death. And you come into the book of Acts and you read there in that first chapter where the disciples were there and Jesus went up out of their sight. And they were just standing there with their mouths gaping open, I imagine it that way. And the angel said to them, Why stand you gazing here up into heaven? For this one has gone into heaven, shall so come again and receive you unto himself. And so Jesus is going to come again someday. And then and there you go through that first chapter and the second chapter. And you find they were going to celebrate Pentecost. And they came back to Jerusalem from all around. There were all kinds of people that were there. And the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And they preached. And 6,000 men and their families, many of their families, got saved. And Joe and Sally no longer had the problem with the guilt. Because their sin was forgiven. And they understood that it was. And it was because of a sacrifice. It was because of blood that was shed. It was because of like the blood sacrifices that they offered in the book of Numbers. But that was just to point to the great supreme sacrifice that was to come. Amen. Which was the Son of God came to this earth. He was crucified at the hands of sinful men. He was placed on the cross. And while he was there, we had, oh yes, intense physical suffering going on. But you also had the sins of the whole world were being placed upon him. And then he said, it is finished. Amen. Jesus died. And the wages of sin is death. And it's, that's the grace. Jesus died, and it's by faith that you receive. For by grace through faith are you saved, and not all of yourselves. Have you ever received the gift of God? You can do so today. Just get with Him. Call upon Him. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It didn't say might be. It didn't say maybe. It said you shall be saved. If you will in faith repent of your sins and call upon the Lord, you can claim the gift of salvation. If you have any doubts whatsoever about your salvation this morning, I would urge you to come to this altar and make sure you've got it right with God. If you never come to Him, especially on the first verse, if you want to come and receive Christ. But you know that we often use this altar here, and I'm glad we do. But any of us can. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a personal problem. We, we might. We might. We might have something that we want God to work with and deal with in our lives. But it, we may be praying about somebody else. We may be praying for all kinds of things. And so we have the altar this morning that we can use. I'll ask our musicians to come. And if you're able to stand with me, I'd ask you to stand. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and after that, we'll have a song of invitation, and we invite you.